Okay. Um, for, for this particular demonstration, I'll try to do it live with GBIF. If it becomes too slow or we have a problem, I will switch. And what I'll switch to is a set of screen captures that are in the GBIF folder uh, that you have copied from the pen drive. I'll show you where that is right now. Here's the JRS data capture course, day one, GBIF data. In here, there are a set of seven slides, let's say, that show you, sorry, that's not the one I want. But that is the one I clicked on. So these will be slides of exactly what I'm about to do live with GBIF. So you can follow through there and see what I did later if you want to. Okay, let's see if we can do it live. So I'm interested in getting data from GBIF and I have many options. I can explore occurrences or data sets or species or by country. I'm interested in specimens. That's the first selection. Exploring data sets means looking at a list of all the data sets that were published. Looking at species is exploring the taxon names. Not the specimens, just the names. And explore by country is a shortcut to getting to data for specific countries, whether it be one of those other categories. I'm going to go directly to explore occurrences because I know I want specimen and observation data because I want to make a map, let's say. So now I come to a page that gives me the current state of data information for occurrences on GBIF. They have 424 million plus occurrence records. That sounds promising. Of those 424,000, 300 million, 361 million are georeferenced. Gives me uh, some idea of how much I might be able to use for mapping. And below, they give me a pretty picture that shows the world over what the distribution of the mapped or georeferenced data look like. So all the lighter colors are where things are. Okay? Just to give us a big overview. And down at the bottom, there are subsets. If I was interested in just the plant records, okay, there are 117 million of those. I could click here and go right into plants. I could go right into mammals and so on. So they're divided up in this way. And there are a few other characteristics of records that they divide up by. Here I can see that there are observations. Most of the records are observations, almost 300 million of them. And less than 100 million are specimens. Less than 90 million are specimens. 31 million, in which we have no idea. It means that the basis of record was not filled in. Two million fossils and so on. And then finally, there's actually an interesting graph, difficult to see maybe from here, of the distribution of records over time temporal characteristics of when they were collected. So more recently, there's much, much, much more information there than there was historically. That map only goes back to 1950. But you can look at the entire view uh, on the GBIF portal as well. I don't want to go into any of those specific ones. I want to construct my search specifically myself. To do that, I'll click on the search link and get into the basically the advanced query interface. So if I wanted, I could click the download button right now and wait for a good long time to get 424 million records of all biodiversity in GBIF. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the records for Benin. So to get just the records for Benin, I'm going to add a filter. In this case, my filter is quite simple. I'll select country, and now I'm given an interface in which country is the field that I'm trying to filter on. Here it's asking me for a country name. So I'll start to type that in, 
and quickly it will tell me what the possibilities are and it allow me to finish off typing it or to select the standard value as it appears in their database. So if I do a search, Benin is one of the real possibilities, spelled in this way. To search for Benin in any other way would not work. So they've actually standardized country already. Then to get just those records, I'll click on Apply. <coughs> Doing so gives me a refined list. Now I've got only the records here in a table that come from Benin. And I can see how many there are in total, 71,000. So I've really reduced. I don't have to look through a lot of information that was not of interest to me. And I can download just that. I can make a more refined filter if I want to by selecting any of these other terms. For example, I could say that I only want records for a given year or after a given year or with a specific catalog number or matching your collector or even just a scientific name. So I have those possibilities. But usually, if the data set is not too big, I keep my filters to a minimum. I want to see it all. So what I'll do then is I'll download the whole data set for the country. And what happens is that they process the request for the download and require you to log in so that they know where to send it. Well, this is one point. And so that they know who is asking for what data, on the other hand. This allows them to make attribution to the original data sources. Look, somebody's coming to GBIF for these data and giving that information, presumably helping them to show that their data have some value. Okay? But I had already logged into the portal. It says, hello, John here. I had done this before. And so it already knows to send me the download. I can look here for its status. And it says expect 10 to 15 minutes for it, and it'll be sent to that email address. And then when the email arrives, I'll have a link. It'll be the same exact link to go get the file once it's been prepared. So that's the process for getting data from GBIF. Any questions about that? Yeah. We'll move question askers to the outside. <laughs> Not very important. Anyone can sign in to be sign up or sign in. Yes. Yes, anyone can create a login on the GBIF portal. It's not a members only. Well, that's a matter of question. I mean, you could say yes, it is because you're required to create a login, um, but anyone is allowed to create a login. Are there more restrictions for maybe someone who is not from a member country? No. Okay. No, for the use of the data, there is no restriction like that. Okay. Uh, or is it filtered somewhere by experts? Or mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is the concern about the data quality from the source and whether the data that are accessible from GBIF have gone through any kind of vetting or validation. <clears throat> and the answer to that is, strictly speaking, no. What has been done by GBIF is to create indexes. The indexes are just interpretations of the original data to try to standardize some things. Basically, to try to standardize the terms that are searched on. So what they do, for example, is they might take the country code for Benin, which I believe is BN. I'm not sure of that. Anyway, the original database might have provided a country code and not a country field or they might have provided a country code in the country field or some kind of an abbreviation. GBIF will try to turn that into a full country name so that when people search, they're getting all the data. They don't have to know that originals were in a country code 
or some abbreviation or a full name. So they've, they've done some things to help people find data, but they haven't done anything to say that the data have any inherent quality or that anyone has proofed them for that purpose. So the, the recommendation then, as is always the case no matter what someone says about the data, is that the consumer has a responsibility to use them responsibly, which means if they have doubts, they should follow up until they're satisfied, which means probably talking to the original collections, if they can, to find out what they need to know. I'm sure town could go a whole day talking about misuse of data and data quality on the other end, right? I think one side is responsible data publishing. Even more important, it should always be the case, is responsible data consumption. Know that you're using it for purposes that it is fit for. One challenge is knowing if it's fit for your purpose. And that can come from either end or from what happens to it in the middle. So part of this course, it's not just strictly data capture, is to try to make sure that you're aware of all of those things and all of those steps and do the best we can at all of those steps. It's a very good question. Others? So the only other thing I wanted to do was to point out that in the afternoon, one of the things was to explore the data that are available from GBIF, to get an idea for your country, what is there, or for your research interests, what is there, what does it look like. And a little bit later in the week, we're going to do some data quality analysis with a tool called OpenRefine, in which we'll use these same data sets to try to understand the content of those data using that tool. But right now, it's just to make sure that you can get it and that you can look at it and have an idea of what it looks like. So to that end, what I have done, Town had sent a message early in our communications about this workshop about a data set for Africa in which there were, I don't know, 13 different Excel spreadsheets, one for each of the countries of interest. What I've done, because Excel might be a problem in this case, is on the, in the folder that I shared with you, I turned each of those into a text file. So it can be used not necessarily just in Excel, but in any data source that you want. So here are the raw text files. Now, one thing that we noticed, um, not sure why, yet, you may never know why, but the, the files, the Excel spreadsheets that were in that archive and the text files here that correspond with them have data only up to 1950. There's plenty of data since 1950. If you remember the graph on GBIF, how after, 2000, or in, after 1950, the amount of data started to increase dramatically. So if you want all the data, you should do the query yourself on GBIF to get the data set of interest, to make sure you have all of it. Okay? So that's basically all I needed to say about GBIF and getting data from there. And that's all I had about all of my topics related to Darwin Core for today also. The rest, when we come back, will be doing exercises related to that. So I'll talk a little bit more to make sure you understand what I want you to do but the lectures are done for today.